everyone. Good morning, everybody. It's a little bit late. Sorry about that. It is 11.13 a.m. on January 28th, 2022. I'm not quite sure how that happened so fast. It is another episode of Tales from the Heart, a podcast from the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. And today I am joined by Dr. Harry Lever the Cleveland Clinic. And in today's discussion, we are going to hit a couple of um, topics over the month of January, which include planning your HCM year. So we're going to talk about what testing should be completed every year for an HCM patient. And then we're going to talk a little bit um, about a topic near and dear to Dr. Lever's heart, and that is the quality of um, oral medications available in the United States and where you might be able to get some better quality um, options for generics for war hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So good morning, Dr. Lever. How are you today? Good. And how's the weather out there in Cleveland? You guys get any good. snow yet? Not good. Not good. We've had a lot of snow and it's snowing again today. And it's, um, yeah, we're getting tired of it. <laughs> To all you down south who complain about the heat, we just want to tell you that up in the north, if there's, snowing, anybody, we're not happy. if there's anybody in Pittsburgh, if they haven't heard the news, there's been a major bridge collapse. I did see that on the news this morning. I yep. didn't hear the details. I, I don't even know if anybody was injured or the bridge was injured. Nobody died. Well, that's good. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. So um, we wish the best to the people in Pittsburgh and their bridge collapse. So today, um, we want to take the opportunity to kind of reset the map for an individual with HCM. And it's January. You're looking at what the year holds ahead. Um, we're already 28 days into the month. But when a patient thinks of their HCM care on an annual basis, what testing should they be getting done? And where should that testing be done? Well, if they have uh, known disease, uh, and let's say they've been stable. Uh, let's say they've had uh, provocable obstruction or rest uh -oh. obstruction, but but they're reasonably symptom free. Uh, okay. Yep, we're good. We just paused for a second. Hello. Okay. All right. Um, then I would say we're looking at an EKG, an echo, and a forty-eight hour Holter monitor once a year. That's pretty much what I've what I've done. If if um, if they have uh, if they're starting to have symptoms, then of course we we've, we've got to you know get in on it and, and look uh, quickly and see what's going on. But if things are if they go to if they're a routine checkup and that's pretty much what we do. Um, if if they've had an MRI scan, maybe three to four years before, then I'd think about doing another one. There's no good criteria yet as to how often we should really do those. They are expensive, but truly speaking, it would, it some, it would help out to have some idea of progression of, of scarring in the muscle. And, you know, I don't think I do it any more than, you know, three, any more frequently than three to four years. But I, I think that that's something that we really ought to be thinking about and not just do it once. M most of what we're doing now has been once, but I think we need to do it a little more frequently. The other thing that I think is helpful is to have a device that you can rely on uh, to monitor your heart rhythm if you start having any troubles. And one of them is an Apple Watch. Uh, they it records the rhythm for about 30 seconds. The advantage of it is, is that you just have it on your wrist, you hit the crystal on the watch, and it'll record your rhythm. It all, there's, depending on which model you get, it also gives you an idea of your oxygen saturation. So if you started feeling dizzy and lightheaded and you could see your rhythm and check your oxygen, that would be of some help. And uh, There's a lot of technologies available for that now. We right. have... Fitbit. Um, I have a Fitbit Sense that does that. Right. There's this new ring technology, which was featured on the television show Billions. Um, which you know about that one? What was oh, the, it's pretty that? cool. It's it's an Apple Watch, but it's a ring, so it's less invasive in that sense. So that's pretty cool. It's a little expensive though. That's why it was on the show Billions. Um, but that's available. Um, but let, let's go back and talk a little bit about the Echo. So if somebody's getting an Echo 
at home, is that the same quality as uh, an echo at a center of excellence? Well, it, that's uh, probably you're better doing it at a center of excellence, but you know, you can make wide statements. I mean, if they, if you're, you know, if you're seeing a reasonable, reasonable cardiologist has had some experience with echoes, that may be all right, but you know, it, it's hard to make sweeping statements about that. Probably it, it's, you know, I, I think it doesn't hurt to go to a center of excellence, you know, every, every year or two. And, you know, depending on how things are going, I mean, and, uh, you know, we've seen, we see many patients uh, once a year at our, at our place. And I think that, that, you know, that's okay. And some physicians would feel relieved that patients do go to centers of excellence. So it's kind of, you can't make sweeping statements, but, you know, they're, they're, you know, sort of how you're feeling about where you're going. I think consistency in the measurements right. is critical. Right. If right. we could have the same teams reading year right. after year, right. I think there's right. a little bit better chance of a consistent right. message. Now there's been one issue that we do have to concern ourselves with is traveling right now with this pandemic, depending on how far you have to travel and where you have to stay and all that kind of stuff. So you know, that, that's, and that seems to be a moving target, you know, where, where, where you are and, and, and how, how, uh, how the pandemic is doing, for instance, here in, 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 in Cleveland, in what we call Cuyahoga County, our numbers have dramatically dropped uh, to some of the lowest in the country in the past couple of weeks. And right. while, while we were sitting very high, now we're really low. So, you know, and I tell people, if, if you have to travel somewhere, check out the New York Times virus maps, and that will tell you where the pandemic is raging and where it's not raging. So that's. So I'll give you the opportunity to give a message to those who still need to hear this message. Right. Dr. Harry Lever, Cleveland Clinic, 40 years of clinical experience. Should everybody become vaccinated? Uh -oh, Everybody. And no. He froze on that one. Asked. There was a dramatic pause there because of technology. So uh, let's do that I'm one again. Sorry. Well, maybe should there's somebody out to get us then. Absolutely. <laughs> everybody should be vaccinated. And I uh I've had I've had some patients call me lately and and I've told them, have you had the vaccine? No. I said, get it this afternoon. No questions asked. Just do it. Because you do not want to get underlying disease from the virus in a heart that's, you know, is, is diseased. And, you, you know, you don't want your coronary arteries to become inflamed. You don't want to have uh, myocardial damage, you know, none of that. And uh, uh, it's, it's very dangerous if people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy do not get the shot. And the okay. other thing to know is we're recommending, and the CDC has recommended now finally, that you should be wearing an N95 mask. Those seem to be the best. As a matter of fact, the government's even sending a few out. Now that, you know, you got, you got to buy your own, but you, you, but you need a good N95 mask. And the other thing is sometimes, and you, you don't have to treat them like a surgical mask. You know, surgeon goes into the operating room, does surgery, and then comes out, he throws that mask away. But we're not doing surgery as, as people out walking the streets or going to stores, and we don't have to worry so much about sterility. What we want to worry about is that we don't inhale the virus. So, you know, you can maybe use it three or four days, then throw it away. And one of the things that I've been doing is we get a cheap surgical mask, put that over top of the N95. That gives you pretty thick, you know, and it's not uncomfortable. No. Uh, and then you throw that one away as soon as you, you know, for the day, you know, maybe just wear it that day and throw that top one away and use the other one for a few more days. And that way you save a little bit of money. So I, that's one of the things that I've recommended. So we believe in vaccination. We believe in boosters. Right. And they're important. And masking. Right. Um, I have some, some friends and family members, distant family members through marriage and whatnot, who are dealing with some pretty significant side effects of COVID at the moment. And if you think that this is just a cold, um, tell that to somebody who's just had a stroke. 
because they didn't think vaccination was, you know, something important to them. Um, and apathy might land you a, a, an ICU bed. So please, again, we won't beat on this one too much, but get your vaccinations, wear your masks, continue to distance, don't gather in, in small spaces uh, in the winter with lots of people. Um, just be careful, people. Um, the, this, this one virus right now is particularly contagious. It may not be as vicious in terms of bad side effects and making people very sick. Some people do get that, particularly if they haven't been vaccinated. But this one spreads widely. And that's why maybe big crowds are not a good idea. And certainly if you're inside with other people, you should uh, wear a mask. So and this is not, and this is not political. This is science. Completely. Good science. Very good science. So as part of planning your HCM year, you do have to consider the COVID situation because you may not have your appointments at your scheduled times if there's a surge. You may need to think about device replacement with the pandemic in your mind. If it looks like your device is gonna get to end a battery life next winter, Maybe you want to be preemptive and go in the fall because we know winter is when flu comes up and we suspect COVID will pop up again. So maybe you want to plan that a little bit. Maybe you want to plan your visit to your center for a spring or summer month as opposed to a winter month. Things like this need to be in the plan. You also need to take a look at your insurance coverages and see who's still in network. If your networks have shifted, do you need to find a different center? We now have. Um, 43 programs around the country. Uh, we're growing. So there's some other ones that are popping up uh, and, and starting to develop and some very big named hospital systems, which I'm really happy about. Um, so there'll be more options for you. We're trying to make it easier, not harder to get to HCM care, but it takes time. So please be patient. Um, so we've got that going on. But you also want to look at your deductibles and your finances and make sure your HSA accounts are maximized if you have them through your employer so that you can use those funds to pay for your health expenses. Um, you just wanna be logical about planning your year. You need to think about when to screen your families. So Harry, how often should a parent uh, who has HCM be screening their child? And we'll assume for the moment, genetic testing didn't prove helpful. So we don't know genetics. Well, what should patients on the, be doing? If, if we don't know what the genes are, um, I would say, that depends on their age. If they're, if they're uh, uh, going through puberty, then I would be looking every year to 18 months because that's when the heart starts to increase in thickness if it's gonna thicken. And uh, if they've if they're at, gotten past their early 20s and they still haven't had it, then maybe you can go three or four years. But, it, but particularly in that growth spurt, that's when you really need to look. So February is going to bring Heart Month, which is just a couple of days away. And every day in Heart Month, we're going to be featuring a different HCM warrior and their story. Most of our warriors are still here with us. Some of them are not. And one of them, whose story will be shared, I think on February 7th, um, and we'll talk more about this in February, but it's a young man who had a family history of HCM. And the local cardiologist told him, you just need to screen every three or four years when the child was about 10 or 11. Child went to the emergency room and had an abnormal EKG. They didn't do anything about it. They told him it was just, you know, it might be his normal, don't worry about it. And two years later, this young man died with undiagnosed HCM at the age of 13. Family screening needs to be done every year for these young people. Yeah, some of the guidelines will push it out to 18 months or, or even to two years, if you, depending upon how you want to read some of them. But one year to 18 months is the reasonable number during adolescence and puberty. And you want to make sure that these kids do not miss the opportunity to be screened and the opportunity to be diagnosed. Um, there's too many kids who didn't get that chance, and we owe it to them to do better for the next generations. So um, please make sure your family screenings are being done appropriately um, and that they're being done by somebody who understands HCM and that they're full testing. 
Um, I've also heard horror stories where community-based screenings was just an EKG or a limited echocardiogram, which I don't even know what that is. Like, how do you limit an echo and how do you know which wall measurements to measure and which ones not to? Um, so I've never seen any proof that a limited echo is diagnostic of HCM. Um, so what should they be looking for in a, in a doctor to do this screening? Well, I would say if you, it, it, you've got to have a cardiologist looking at it. I would not go to a, a general internist or a general practitioner. I would, I'd make sure you're seeing a cardiologist. And, that, you know, uh, I, I think that again, uh, I would try locally particularly with all that's going on and not have to travel and get on airplanes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, um, but, you know, once hopefully we're, we're past this horrible pandemic, then I'd be, you know, if, if it, if it looks like a strong family history, then I would be uh, going to a center of excellence. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Um, okay. So, there's something else we're working on this year, Harry. We didn't really prep for this one, but you know it well. So how are we going to improve the knowledge of physicians in the community? Through HCM Academy. Right. And uh, Dr. Lever is one of our educators through HCM Academy, and we're really happy to have him on the team. Um, technology has been a bit of a challenge, but we're learning how to work with new systems to make this happen. Um, but... HCM Academy is available for you, the patients, to share with your healthcare providers to give them an opportunity to join a class with Dr. Lever and learn about HCM straight from Dr. Lever and other thought leaders in the country on HCM. John Szymanski is running some classes. There's a couple of other individuals who have already started populating their classes. I don't remember who everybody is that's doing them right now, but we've got an amazing team and an amazing curriculum. So uh, you can learn about that at the hcmacademy.org, or you can go straight to the HCMA website and sign up your doctor uh, to be part of this program. So we're really excited about that. And we're about to make a major investment in a communications opportunity to reach 100,000 general practitioners and pediatricians. So wish us luck in populating the HCM Academy curriculum and getting these sessions set up. We're gonna to try to keep you busy, Harry. Okay, uh, what, what was your experience with HCM Academy, the first couple of courses that you've run? What, what were the uh, physicians thinking? Uh, they, the first one I did, they didn't, they didn't, we tried to have them ask questions and nobody seemed to wanna to do it. So either I, I explained everything well or they just went over their head but I think it, it actually seemed to go okay and the, the people that the administrators that were doing it thought things went well fantastic so yeah. you can sign up for that and maybe Ross or whoever is watching on uh, Facebook now can put, put a link up to the HCMA page for um, HCM Academy so that's coming up this year we're really excited about that we will open up to questions in just a few minutes so if you have anything you want to ask you can populate it now and then i can get to it when we get to q a um so i wanted to talk a little bit about um okay wait, wait let me make sure we covered everything for the year so we need an echo an ekg a halter monitor or a zio patch by today's standards right. um so a little bit longer of a, a monitor we need an MRI every couple of years, maybe three to four years on the MRI, still jury out. Um, genetic testing should be reevaluated with your center when you check in to see if any knowledge has changed or if there's an opportunity for additional genetic testing. Um, and device management, please remember to get your devices checked every year, um, at least on the systems that are bedside, we know that they'll send alerts, but some of the older devices might still need physical check-ins and physical monitoring. Um, so don't forget about your devices. Um, plan out your financial uh, medical expenses for the year as well as you can. Uh, make sure that you're looking at your co-pays and deductibles. One issue I did want to bring up that is new this year is there has been a change in the federal law regarding going to a hospital and getting surprise bills from non- um, uh, non-network individuals working within a networked hospital. They can't do that anymore. Yay. Uh, so that's a good thing. So don't get, don't pay those bills from somebody who says, 
I saw you and I'm at a network. So that's a thing. Um, and what else do we have? Um, got some questions coming in here. Um, check in with the HCMA regularly because there's lots of clinical trials coming up this year that you might want to learn about and be part of. So stay tuned for information on that. And that's about it on the year updates. Did I miss one, anything? One, one more thing. One more thing that ought to be mentioned is routine dental visits. You should have uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. And, should. Yeah. And this is another area, a little bit of controversy. Um, uh, let's just take a minute to kind of roll that one back. So in the 70s and 80s, they said, oh, this thing called endocarditis can be solved by some antibiotics. Typically today, it's what, 2,000 milligrams of amoxicillin. Right. And if you don't have anything implanted in your heart. Yeah. So that stops the bacteria from breeding in your mouth, getting into your bloodstream, landing in your heart where you have turbulent blood flow which can lead to the buildup of endocarditis. Yours truly had it in 1990. Not fun at all. It caused me to have a stroke. Very serious, could have killed me. One of our board members actually had endocarditis this year as well. So it doesn't go away. But about 12 years ago, there was a big push that we were giving too many antibiotics out. And while we can agree that people were begging for antibiotics from their doctors when they had viruses and they were just being given because, and we know we bred superbugs because of this problem. It has nothing to do with premedication one time every couple of months for a bacteria that might build up in your mouth and cause you a consequence. So they backpedaled on the guidelines and they changed them and they took the guidelines and they said, well, if you don't have turbulent blood flow, you shouldn't have to have antibiotics. So not everybody with HCM has turbulent blood flow. So we'll just take the whole class out, which was one of the biggest mistakes I've ever witnessed in medical literature. I'm like, this is so short-sighted. And what we're seeing happening now is endocarditis is starting to creep back in right. because we're not taking a shot of antibiotic before we go to a dentist. So I'm gonna take the guidelines language and say very clearly shared decision-making you get to share in the decision-making whether or not you want to take a dose of antibiotics before you go to a dentist to protect yourself against a potentially life-threatening condition, endocarditis, or not. Well, shared decision-making. Well, I would, I, would, I would say that the fact is the American Heart Association made a mistake. I had occasion to talk to one of the day those recommendations came out. I made a phone call and told them they were making a mistake. And the fact of the matter is I had seen a few patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who did not get antibiotics and they got into terrible trouble because of the thickened heart muscle. And then you get a sudden leakage of a mitral valve or an aortic valve. It puts a terrible strain on the heart and they can go into heart failure very quickly. And, you know, Numbers of us who treat this disease have felt this way that we antibiotics are really important when you go to the dentist and you, you, you must take it seriously because it, it, you, it, you can find yourself in the operating room within days when something like that happens. And I've seen that happen. So, so pre-medicate before dental work. Thank right. you for bringing that up, Harry. Very important point. Um, right. And, and I do hope that in future iterations of guidance documents, we clear that up and right. we give patients the power to protect themselves with something as simple as a dose of antibiotic. That's right. Um, I do have to give a shout out here to somebody I haven't seen on a live podcast in a couple of weeks. And it's Stephanie from the UK. Hello, my dear, who is watching us and listening to us with her brand new heart working. So congratulations on your very successful transplant and I can't wait to speak with you soon. Um, okay, we have a question here and then we're gonna pivot to the drug issue. Um, Jocelyn, I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses on so your name looked like Jacqueline for a minute. Uh, I'm 65 and diagnosed with my, and having my myectomy next year, wait a second. I don't have my glasses on people, I'm so sorry, I'm 65. Until diagnosed with HCM at 61 and myectomy next year, I was told abnormally KG was normal for me. 
and to carry a piece of paper in my wallet. Yeah. So you have abnormal EKGs typically with HCM. I do believe it is a wise practice to take a photo of your EKG and show it to emergency room staff if you should be there for something else um, or keep a copy of it with you at all times so that you can show a medical provider. So in the event of, and I'll give you an example, I got into a little fender bender back uh, about 15 years ago and they brought me to the emergency room and they wanted to do an EKG because they wondered, you know, had I lost consciousness because I have a history of heart problems? I'm like, no, no, no. Somebody hit me in a snowstorm and, you know, whacked my neck out and that was that. Well, they were going to do the EKG and I'm like, if you see the EKG, you're going to freak out because I don't have a photo of my old one with me and I look like I've had a heart attack, but I'm not having a heart attack. I have HCM. I don't want to do the EKG. And the nurse thought I was crazy and told me the doctor wasn't going to be happy with me. I said, send him in. I'll talk to him. (laughs) So I'm like, look, if you do the EKG, you're going to see the following things. You're going to see an intermittent right bundle branch block. You're going to see possible infarct in the left ventricle. It's going to freak you out. You're going to want to send me to the cath lab. I'm going to deny. It's going to get dramatic. Let's just not do the EKG. (laughs) I'm fine. And he looked at me and he said, you've got a very valid point. I'm not ordering the EKG. And the nurse came in. She said, I've never seen that happen before. So be careful of not having your information at moments of crisis. It just would have been a lot easier to do the EKGs, told them I'm fine. Look, this is my normal. I'm good. But it could have turned into drama. So don't go to drama. Um, So do bring a copy of your EKG everywhere. Um, Harry, what do you think about genetic testing today? Should people get genetically tested? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's helpful if uh, if you uh, if there's some family members that already have you know the positive gene, and if you don't, if you're lucky and you're tested and you don't have it, then you can forget about ever continuing screening. That's a that's a major advantage. Some of the problems we're facing though is that only about thirty percent now are we really finding positive genes, and then there's the problem of uh, coming across with a study that we don't think significant or not, you know, and so that means then we're continuing to monitor people over time. That's not bad, but you know, it's not, it's not as, uh, perfect. It's not perfect. Like people would wish it would be. And, and again, the incidence of what we're finding is not quite as high as it was thought to be. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. And again, if there's a family, if there is a positive gene in the family, then the, the, the brothers or sisters or, or the children should be looked at. And if you can eliminate, the, because there'll be some that won't have the disease at all. And if you have a situation where it is negative, and the, you know, then, then you can forget about it. You won't have to worry about it for the rest of your life. Okay, I'm going to go over three more questions and then we're going to talk about drug quality. Um, So new devices in the past eight, 10 years have options on them that can detect heart failure. One of them is called Optival. Um, My old device had that. Um, So the role of heart failure monitoring through devices is evolving. Um, Do you have any strong thoughts or opinions on the use of implantable technology to help monitor for heart failure? Well, I don't know. I think we need to see how, I haven't seen one of those devices yet. I think we need to uh, have some idea, you know, when you start implanting things that sometimes things go, go haywire. I mean, we've had enough um, you know, we've had enough trouble with defibrillators and pacemakers with wire fractures and things like that, that we then have experts that know how to remove those things. So we don't want to put more into the heart than we absolutely need to. And I think we need a little more time to evaluate those sorts of things. So I, I know that, um, I'll just say somebody I know has one of those devices and over diureased herself on a particular day. And then got notified that her fluid volume had shifted dramatically, which set up flares of, oh, there might be heart failure on board. But you've got to remember if you drop fluid quickly and pull it back up to normal, 
that's going to show as a fluctuation. And what these devices do is they monitor normal. And when they see a fluctuation from normal, like I do believe there's probably the potential to throw this off just by overly salty meals a couple of days in a row because you're going to pull your fluid volume up. Um, so it's a good monitor of where your fluid volume is. And I think there's some value to the technology, but I don't think you can rest completely upon that and let the device do all the work. You have to drink well, rest well, take your medication well, not overly indulge in salty foods, et cetera, and keep your balance. And, and also not overindulge in alcohol. Yes, we know Harry doesn't like alcohol. At least he likes a little alcohol. It's okay. We agree to disagree on certain things, um, but overindulging is bad. Um, Christina, you're welcome on that one. And let's see what else we have. Um, so Susan, I'm not going to be able to have Dr. Lever give this exact information because it's a little too specific and that would be him consulting on a case over podcast and that's not right, but I will talk about it in general. So we have a, a young man who's got massive hypertrophy. He has COVID and they're suggesting a Z pack for him. Um, so let's take that in the general sense. We know that Z pack has been associated with an increased risk of arrhythmia in some, and it's been a black box warning for a while now, but we've not seen anything specific to the HCM community. Um, in a negative implication with z packs in general, it tends to be those related with long QT syndrome may have a problem there, but I've not seen much with HCM. I used to take z packs all the time. So Harry, any problem with this? No, I, I don't think I'd be too worried about that. I think, uh, but I think um, you got to have a little bit, you need a little better idea of what's going on with the patient. You know, what's the chest X-ray look like? What's the, or if they've done a C even more important, what's a CT scan look like? Because, you know, if there's excessive scarring or something like that. And some people have actually said that you can uh, um, uh, make the diagnosis of the virus uh, sometimes always worrying, waiting for the blood. Sorry, your audio you can, keeps, uh, you, blood they keep jumping out on you. What, I'm here, you hear me now? I do. I'm you just have a little bit of a pause. So sometimes I might ask you to just repeat yourself so we can edit it out during real pod when the podcast goes up. Um, so you were saying about. I would say it's, it's import important to take a look at a chest x-ray or a CT scan to make sure that there's uh, what's going on in the lungs. I mean, certainly if it looks like you have a lung infection, then yeah, antibiotics are important, but it's not, it's not always, it's not necessary all the time just to give people antibiotics for if they have the, the virus. Okay. Um, I hope Susan, that helped you a little bit, um, but I do hope that you reach out to your cardiologist and get some clearance. And uh, typically after somebody has gotten over COVID and they do have HCM, it's a really wise idea for them to um, get an echocardiogram within three to six months after the COVID to ensure that no myocarditis has influenced the heart at all and that the heart is still where we thought it was when we started this little adventure. So please make sure you set that appointment up and you get screened after COVID. Um, Gerald, our newly listed uh, upgraded transplant uh, warrior to be, uh, you have a question about genetic testing. Um, so if you have genetic testing, could that affect you and have issues getting insurance, health insurance, life insurance be a problem? So in 2008, uh, yours truly and a lot of other people uh, helped pass something called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. It was signed into law by George Bush. And under the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, the use of genetic information is banned for purposes of educational opportunities, um, employment opportunities or health insurance. It can be, however, used to rate life insurance and long-term disability policies. So genetic status should not impact somebody's livelihood with one pretty major exception. And people forget about this one. The federal government writes itself out of most laws like this. 
So if you work for the federal government, if you're going into the military, if you're serving in certain capacities, they can take that information into consideration before offering you employment or advancing your employment. So that's the only place it can be used against you in an employment situation. Um, but that's considered for a safety purpose um, and a budgeting purpose. Uh, so we, the federal government tends to write itself out of most laws. You know, it's like illegal to do insider trading unless you're a member of Congress or the Senate, which we still allow them to do. Why is that? <laughs> I just went off on a tangent, sorry. Um, but you do have um, the opportunity to use that genetic information to screen your family and feel comfortable and safe that it's not gonna be used against them for employment, for education and for their health insurance. Um, okay, I'm gonna pivot back out and look back at the questions again. I have to refresh every time. You're welcome, you're welcome. And we answered those questions. Okay, Harry's favorite topic, drug quality in America. So for those of you who have not heard Dr. Harry Lever speak on this topic before, um, I'm gonna give a very quick cliff note version of a synopsis. Not all drugs are created equal. Not all drug manufacturers are providing the level of quality of drug that we think that they are. And this is a major problem. And we as Americans need to do more to ensure that we have not only well-priced availability of drugs, but that the quality is what we are thinking that it is. Example, there was a problem with one drug that works for the transplant community, tacrolimus. I personally was affected by this. That's why I'm picking this one to talk about. There's lots of other examples. The manufacturer of the drug, the difference between the manufacturers varied my levels exponentially and put me into a dangerous low zone because they don't metabolize the same way because the inert ingredients are different and the dissolution rate, which how fast it uptakes into your body, varies. And if you have a name brand drug, you know what the normal is and that's what everything's supposed to be based on, but they're not all equal. And we've had problems with crumbly metoprolol and it doesn't titrate well. And we know a lot about that now. And there's a lot more research being done on that particular topic. Harry, did I give a good synopsis? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, many of the, about 90% of the active ingredients in drugs are coming from China and about 40 to 50% of the finished drugs are coming from India. And uh, unfortunately, the, there's not enough care taken where these drugs are manufactured. And we've had all kinds of situations with uh, drugs where they just don't seem to work well. And uh, we've even had, uh, 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 there's a drug low, low uh, they're, they're called angiotensin receptor blockers. And one of, the, one of them in particular, low sartan, uh, was made by a Chinese company. They changed the way the drug was being made in 2011. Nobody knew about it until it was found by some German investigators in 2018. And it means that for about seven years, people were taking drugs that had carcinogens in them. And uh, so... You, you've got, got to be very careful about the brand that you uh, take. And you, one of the things that I tell patients is that if you're stable on something, like you're treating blood pressure or something of that sort, uh, do not let the pharmacy change the manufacturer. When you, when you, before you take the pills out of the drugstore, look at what they gave you. And if they're different than what they've given you before, then you've got to uh, uh, tell them not to change it. It's very important to do that also with diuretics. I've had numbers of patients who suddenly go into heart failure when the manufacturer of the drug was, that the diuretic was changed. And uh, it, it's really a bad problem. And uh, everybody thinks that, um, you know, it's, things are tested, but they're not. And that's one of the things that we've got to be doing more of. And we're looking to start initiatives to do that. The drugs should be tested before uh, patients swallow them. If you go out and you buy food from a food manufacturer, some of these 
big manufacturers, they test the food before it leaves the factory. And that's what needs to happen with drugs. And it's not always consistently done. And that's become a major problem. We've had patients probably readmitted to the hospital because they, their drug was changed. Everybody assumed that everything is the same. It's not, and they got into trouble. And um, it's, it's really a very serious problem. And we're, we're trying to get this fixed. Um, we've, uh, yeah, I mean, that we, wrote a, we wrote a paper on tacrolimus and we found that indeed certain, certain manufacturers, it just was not the same. And some of the patients had gotten into terrible trouble with organ rejection. And even we even had a couple that died because they changed the manufacturer. And one of the problems you must be aware of as a patient is the pharmacy may change the manufacturer and they don't tell the physician that they're changing. And that's, that's a very serious problem. And uh, it's all based on price, not on quality. So this problem has a name and it has variable definitions. Uh, this does fall under what's called non-medical switching. And that means the drug companies, the PBM, not the drug companies, not the drug manufacturers, the PBMs, the plan benefit administrators, the people who control drug flow in this country, they buy on price. There's a problem going on with Eliquis right now with some specific um, care mark plans under CVS care mark. Um, there's a couple of healthcare plans that will no longer cover Eliquis and they're moving everybody to Zeralto. That's a bigger problem, but changing the manufacturer is also a problem because if you are consistent on one manufacturer, that's what your body's used to, how that drug metabolizes. And it may not be exactly like the name brand, but it's working for you. So if you keep moving that, you're moving the target and you're changing the homostasis of the body. And we can't do that. We need to keep consistent with certain drugs. Um, and Harry and I were talking before podcasting today about a really important thing for the HCM community with relationship to this drug quality issue. And that is um, the availability of Topral XL, the most commonly used drug in HCM, um, from a new company who bought it from AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca is still producing it under the name of New American Therapeutics. And just a few moments ago, I spoke to the CEO of New American Therapeutics, a gentleman by the name of Mike Anderson, and I threatened him that he might come on the podcast with me someday. And he said, maybe, but we that'll be a big conversation. I'm like, okay, let's do it. So Mike, we might be doing that. So we talked about prices. And if you want the Topral XL, and it's got to be purchased by a PBM, 100 pills is about 130 Two dollars, roughly. The authorized generic, which is manufactured in the same way, just in different batches by the same factories, is fourteen dollars and thirty cents for a hundred. So that's a three-month supply. That's their cost. HCMA is going to be reaching out to some private pharmacies, who we are going to try to connect with New American Therapeutics, so that we have a known source of authorized generic at a reasonable price through a reasonable pharmacy. There is a program out of um, Florida, but it's a little expensive. It's like $30 a month. And why are we paying $30 a month if it's really only $15 for three months, right? So we, there's going to have to be some reason for the pharmacy to be in this business. So there'll be a fee on it, but we're going to try if we can to negotiate some deals between them and, and get them to provide a, a, a quality drug to our community at a reasonable price. Um, and the other thing he told me was CVS Caremark. So that's Cardinal Health, CVS Caremark, they're all one company. We'll not even speak to him about produce or providing it for their customers. So they can't even talk to them because his price is too high. And they wanna just get the cheaper version. The Kesson, who is Rexall Pharmacies and a lot of other pharmacies, the, the McKesson Pharmacies will buy from them. 
So if you are on the tropolol and you want an authorized generic and you can find a pharmacy near you who uses McKesson as their primary provider or um, what's the other company? Uh, Ver Verisource, I think it's Verisource, I think it's the other big um, uh, competitor in the uh, drug market. Um, they also are, are working with New American Therapeutics on the authorized generic. So it's just, you're not going to get it at CVS. It's just not going to be there. So take that information and do what you need to do with it. Um, we hope that CVS Caremark understands the importance of metropolol and the quality of metropolol to the HCM community and others, and that they reverse course and that they do enter into discussions with New American Therapeutics. We need good drugs. And this is what we have to do to get them. It's pretty sad. Okay, Harry, how is that? Okay. Again, the most important thing is if you're stable on something, do not let them change it. One of the other drugs that we, people that have thyroid disease, if they're hypothyroid and they're started on a drug to treat that, levothyroxine, and once they're stabilized, the blood tests are fine. Particularly, the Endocrine Society recommends you do not change the manufacturer, even a name brand from one name brand to another. You stay on the same drug and you, it's, it's, it's really important to do that. Seizure drugs are the same way. If you're, if you had seizures and you're, you're on an anti-epileptic drug and it's under control, absolutely do not let them change the manufacturer. And, and I have to give props to the, um, to the epilepsy uh, patient advocacy movement. They did actually get a law passed, I believe in Utah, that right. it's illegal to change drugs for epileptics without physician approval, even if it's just a manufacturer shift. Um, so bravo to them for that. And we should emulate that around the country. Um, Carrie wants to say hi. Her husband, Tim, was one of your patients until he had a transplant in June of 2020. And uh, her insurance company is covering ProGraph so they can say on brand name. So, hey, another, another transplant warrior. Okay, um, I do have to get off to another call in a few minutes yeah, here. Yeah, um, a couple of announcements. Um, February starts American Heart Month. Please stay tuned to the HCMA all month long. Every day we will be featuring a new HCM warrior and their story and a call to action. You'll be able to get involved with the HCM Act to help ensure all children are screened for cardiac disease at their well-child exams. You'll be able to engage your physicians in HCM Academy so they can learn from wonderful people like Dr. Lever. You'll be able to sign up to support groups and discussion groups with the HCMA. We have a big hearted warrior tour coming up for February and some very exciting new announcements that I can't talk about yet. But ladies and gentlemen, the HCM world is gonna get shaken up a little bit, all for the good and some wonderful things are coming. So I'm going to leave that as a teaser. Dr. Lever, thank you as always for joining us on Tales from the Heart. Lovely to have you. And ladies and gentlemen, we are going to end the broadcast. <laughs>